Today is a very special day. It's the seventh day of Adar, which is the Yorzeit and also the birthday of Moshe Rabbeinu. So, most appropriately, we'll devote our words this evening to Moshe Rabbeinu. As we've done in the past with relating to other uh, great figures in the Torah, we'll try to to paint a picture of Moshe Rabbeinu using the classic model of the of Kabbalah, which is the Sfirot, the, the 10 or 11 Sfirot. And then afterwards, we'll open up the works of the Abrizal, the greatest of the Mukubalim of the Kabbalists, and see how he traces and outlines the the history or the chronology of the soul of Moses as it passes through all times and all generations of history. From generation to generation there is Moses. But that soul which is most present in all times from actually the beginning of creation even before he was born as Moses, the redeemer of Exodus and the giver of the Torah. Even previously, his soul was, was here. Of all souls, this soul is the most present from the beginning of creation until Mashiach, to the extent that Moses himself is the Mashiach. He says he is the first redeemer and he is the final redeemer. The Arizal says that, that actually his soul is reborn into the world every 50 years. 50 years is the Jubilee. As Moses is the secret of the Jubilee, of the 50 year period, which is called a whole world in the Torah. And every 50 years he returns and he appears within the generation. Not always are we uh, able to recognize and identify exactly who it is, but actually the Rizzo says that it, not only is it a figure, but a living uh, human being, but it is the spirit of the generation as a whole, just as in the time of the Moses of the Torah, the whole generation are souls that are sparks of his soul. The whole generation is called Dor Dea, generation of knowledge, because Moses is the all-inclusive soul of knowledge. Knowledge means the power to connect, to, to know God. And every Jew has that power, as explained in the Tanya, to know God, to know the presence, to feel the presence of God, and to feel the presence of God in your life. That is the spark of Moses in your soul. It's once when Moses must come and be present at all times, in order that we be able to know our Creator and to serve our Creator. This week's Torah reading that we just began today is Titzaveh. It's the one and only portion in the entire Torah since Moses is born at the beginning of the, of the book of Exodus until the end of the Torah that his name does not appear explicitly in the whole Torah par portion. The reason is that there's something very special about this uh, reading, that Moses goes up, his soul is elevated until its, until its ultimate source, which is called Ayin, the divine state of nothingness, which actually is called, referred to as the source of all souls, of all souls of Israel. Ayin Mazal Yisrael, the Ayin, the divine nothing, is the Mazal, meaning the soul root of Israel. And in this week's Torah portion, the Torah teaches us that Moses ascends to that source in divine nothingness, and that's why his name does not appear, because he he's nothing. That level of returning to one's 
soul source in Ayin, which is also called returning into one's source in Elohim, the name of God that creates the world, recreates the world every second. That is the keter, the crown of the soul of Moses. Which in the soul, the crown is super conscious, it's above consciousness. That's why his name does not appear consciously, explicitly. Explicitly means consciously. Moses is referred to as Ish HaElokim, the man of God. There are other prophets after Moses in the Bible that are also referred to by the same uh, connotation, Isha Elohim, the man of God. But Moses is the primary, he's the first and the primary, and actually all of the other great prophets that are referred to as Isha Elohim are so referred to because they are reflections of Moses, is that Moses appears and speaks through them. The uh, Gematria, numerical value of Isha Elohim, man of God, equals exactly Ben Amram, the son of Amram, which is the normal connotation by which Moses is referred to. Referred to by the son of his father. Not all Tzadikim are referred to by the son of their father. In the whole of the Bible, there are two. The two greatest souls that are referred to as the son of the father are Moses, Ben Amram, the son of Amram, and David, King David, Ben Yishai, the son of Jesse. Actually, these two souls that are referred to as the son of the father are the two components of the Mashiach to be. We said before that Moses himself returns and appears as the Mashiach. But it says that his body or his external Reality is his biological descendants from King David. His soul, his spirit, his teaching to the world is the return of Moses. His workings, his acts in the world have to do with King David and come from the power of King David. These are the two souls that are referred to by their father, the son of Amram, and the son of Yishai. And that, uh, that term, the son of Amram ben Amram, equals exactly Yishai Elohim, the man of God. How do Chazal interpret that, uh, that phrase, the man of God? They say a very amazing thing. They say that Moses has two halves to him. From half up, he's God, Elohim. And from half down, he's a man, Ish. Ish means a man. In general, throughout the whole Bible, when it says man, it doesn't specify which man we're talking about. So very often, Chazal say that just the word man itself, to say someone is a man, ish, refers to Moses. That each one of us that were a ish, a man, there are different levels of, it, of the human being. There's Adam, Adam, ish, Gever, and knows there are actually four different uh, words for man. But to say that he's a man, that you're a man, which actually a man in Hebrew applies an adult. It applies maturity. That you're a mature, developed man, that refers to, to Moses. But once more, the, the sages say that his manhood is from half down. And his relative divinity is from half up. When Moses returns to his source in Ayin, actually he's returning to the, the peak of his half up, which is Elohim. That's as we said before, that Ayin, nothing is actually the sole root in God. Every soul is a actual part of God. It doesn't possess a particular name because it's God himself, as it were. That's his crown. His ish, his level of manhood, that is a man from half down, that refers to his sphira, the power 
and the divine illuminance, which is called Yisod, foundation. That in his foundation is a tzaddik Yisod Olam, the righteous one figure, who is the foundation of the generation, the foundation of the world. That's the ninth of the ten Sfirot from Keter. That's where he is an Ish. The word Ish means man, it also means husband. When you have a man and a woman, a husband and a wife, so the, the husband is not called Adam. He's actually the word Adam in the beginning of creation refer, refers both to Adam and to Eve as a collective unity. So the husband per se is not Adam, but the husband per se is Ish, is a man. And that very same phrase, man of God, in the Zohar, it's interpreted to read that he's, so to speak, the husband of the Shekhinah, of the divine inner presence of God, the imminence. But the light of God is both transcendent and imminent. And the imminent dimension of God's life is called the Shekhinah, the divine presence. And so to speak, Moses is like the husband. It's a, the divine presence is a feminine figure. And he is the husband of, that, uh, of the divine presence. It means that he gives, as it were, a spiritual divine input, or maybe he reveals, like shines a flashlight to reveal to us the divine presence in our lives, which is the imminence of God in our lives. So once more, that's his yesod. So in this phrase, Isha Elohim, that from half up Elohim and from half down, Ish, man, is actually referring to his crown and to his breed. The covenant, the divine covenant is the Yesod, Tzadik Yesod Olam. That's where he is an Ish. So we already have, have identified now two Sfirot in Moshe Rabbein and Moses. Let's go back a, a moment to what we said before in the beginning, the name of the Arizal, that his soul returns every 50 years. So if it returns every 50 years to, to this world, how many times does it return in one millennium, in a thousand years? In a thousand years it returns 20 times. This Torah reading, it's always the 20th Torah portion in the Torah. The word 20 in Hebrew equals keter, crown. Not only does the word equal crown, but many things about the number 20 also refer or allude to the crown, to the super rational and super conscious crown. If Moses returns 20 times in every thousand years, so how many times does he return from the beginning of creation to the end of the six millennia of this order? Because I'll teach us that the world order is six millennia. So it's six times 20, how much is six times 20? It's 120. But we know that that number relates uh, immediately to Moses because we know that Moses lives 120 years. And that actually every year that Moses lived is one jubilee. Every year is a ju every one of his 120 years is a jubilee year, which means a 50 year period which is a whole world, a new world. And from beginning of creation to the end, he comes back 120 times. We say that Moses actually was here with us even before the Exodus. Where does the Torah do to that? In the generation of the flood, the time of Noah, one of the incarnations of Moses is Noah, as we'll explain. So it says that Bishagam Hubasa, there's a word that says that uh, Hashem will give us another 120 years. Which is a very, very clear reference to Moses. 
And the, a very special word that appears only one time in the Bible there, the word bishagam equals 345, which is the numerical value of Moses. So that's the phrase from which the sages say that Moses was present in the flood, which is many, many years, almost a thousand years before the Moses that we know of appeared on the face of history. So once more, Moses comes back 120 times from the beginning of history until the end. So now we'll continue with the with the Sfirot uh, of Moses. When Moses is born, see also at the beginning he wasn't given a name, or at least an explicit name doesn't appear until until the daughter, the princess, the daughter of Pharaoh, saved him, took him out of the river. He was in a little ark, just like Noah was in an ark. So he also had his teva, his little ark, when he was an infant. And uh, afterwards she called him by name, and she actually, she gave the name Moses, implying that Moses probably is, uh, is a, has some Egyptian root to it, because it was given by the, by, the, by the daughter of Pharaoh. And she explained the, the rationale behind the giving of the name Moses, that I have drawn him out. It comes from the word also in Hebrew, which means to draw out from the water. I've taken his soul out of the water. It means that Moses is a water soul. We know that Ein Mayim Torah, there is no the word water refers to the Torah. There's no water other than the Torah, the water of the soul. And in the Sirot, that's the Sirah of wisdom. Because the Torah comes from wisdom. The Torah is wisdom, it's the divine wisdom of Hashem that He gives us. And by saying that Moses is drawn from the water, that means that He is drawn from the Sirah, from the from the light and the channel of creation of wisdom, which is the first conscious channel of creation after the superconscious crown. So Moses and his affinity to water, because that's where he's coming from, is his wisdom. But there's a phrase in the sages that Moses merits understanding. Understanding is the next fira after wisdom. It means that he's coming from wisdom and he's going to understanding. Wisdom is the father principle in Kabbalah. Understanding is the mother principle. In the mind, the, the right side of the mind is wisdom, the left side is understanding. Moses comes from wisdom, from the water, but he goes and he merits to reach and achieve understanding. What does that mean in his life, in the Torah? Where do we read in the Torah that he achieved understanding? When he asked to envision God, godliness, and God answered him, you can't see my face, you can only see my back. So, in Kabbalah, it's explained that seeing the back of God is his merit to understanding. Understanding what? Not understanding God's very essence, that's the face of God, but understanding the way God controls the world, which is called Hanhaga in the Torah. The word Hanhaga means the way God runs the world. So, God revealed to him the way he runs over, what he does, how he does it. Why he does it, that's another question. To know why God does what he does, you ha actually have to know the face of God. To understand why, you have to know God's very essence. But at a certain point, Moses also merits that. That's called the 50th gate of understanding, that he merited to at the moment that he passed from this world, this order, 
And it says, also before the sin of the golden calf that we'll read next week in the Torah, when the Torah was given, he also merited it. So he had that, even the level of the face for a certain period before the sin of the golden calf, it was taken away from him. And at the very end of his life, he receives it again. But once more, that, that throughout his life, God says, and he said this after the sin of the golden calf, he said to him, you can't see my face, but you can, you can see my back. Once more, the back means the way I run the world. There's another thing about Moses that we all know that of all the attributes of the soul, he is praised by one and only one attribute, his humility. Aish Moshe Nav he is very, very humble more humble than any other soul on the face of the earth. In Kabbalah, that humility also is a, an expression of understanding. It means that he understands that nothing that he does in his life, nothing that he accomplishes is his. In. Whatever he merits is a pure gratis gift from on high to the extent that it says that he thinks, he contemplates to himself, that were my talents, my innate talents given to someone else, he would definitely use them and realize them better than, than me. So, so once more, his, the humility of Moses is explained to be a property of his understanding. So when it says that Moses merits understanding, that also includes his exceptional level of humility that no other human reached. So after we have wisdom and understanding, the next property in Kabbalah is knowledge. We said before that the generation of Moses is called the generation of knowledge, Dorothea. And since he is the leader of the generation, he is the all-inclusive soul of the generation, means that he is the epitome or the all-inclusive state of knowledge. And this is what we said before, that we're taught in Kabbalah, and especially in Sefer Atanya, has explained that the, not the power, the ability to know, to know God, is the presence of Moses. He is the knowledge of all souls of Israel. Another thing, every great soul, until the coming of Mashiach, when evil, or what's called the other side, will be annihilated, every soul has an anti-soul. Just like in the quantum physics, every particle has an anti-particle. So, so, in, so in souls, in spiritual physics of souls, every soul has an anti-soul. Sometimes the anti-soul also appears in different phases, in different ways. The anti, one of the great anti-souls of Moses as a prophet is Bil'am. So that just like Moses is in the side of holiness of Kedusha, so just like him is Bil'am, Bilam is the one that wanted to curse the Jewish people, but the end, in the end, Hashem forced him, coerced him to bless instead of curse. Bilam says of himself, he praises himself, he says that I know the supernal knowledge, Yodea Dat And from this we understand that he is the opposite, the antithetical, antithetical, soul to Moses, to Moshe Rabbeinu. That Moshe has the dot, the understanding of the knowledge of Kedusha of holiness, means the ability to connect in one's mind, in one's heart to good. And he is the opposite, the very strong connection to what's not good, That's what is not faith and knowledge of God. So from this very phenomenon 
that Moses' opposite is knowledge, from this we learn how much he himself is knowledge. Sometimes you learn about the good from the counterpart, from the counterpart of evil. So we're taught in relation to Moses and Bil'am. The sages say about Moses that he, Moses ohev Yisrael haya, he was a great lover of Israel. That God told him to teach us so and so, and to Moses himself he revealed deeper levels and dimensions of the Torah that he was not commanded explicitly that he must convey and teach the people. But he on his own, since he had a good eye and everything that he possessed, he wanted to share with everyone else. So that good eye and that sharing, all of his gifts with all of us, with all of the people, that's called his, the expression of his love, his great love of Israel. There's a verse that reads, Molich li amin Moshe, that Moses also leads the people with the right, the right, like the right hand, with his right hand he leads the people. The right hand in Kabbalah is chesed, the next sphere. We're now talking about loving kindness. After knowledge comes loving kindness. He had great love. The Torah he received from Chokhmah. The branch in the tree of life of Chokhmah is loving kindness, chesed. So the first expression is that he taught us the Torah with love, with a good eye. But he also led us throughout all the trials and tribulations of the desert, all the 40 years that he led us, he led us with the right. One of the meanings of the right is that he led us with miracles. The left is nature. One of the meanings of right and left in Kabbalah is that nature is the left, but right is miracle, is supernatural. So once more Moses, as we see it, we read the Torah, the whole 40 years was continual miracles. The manna that followed, also the, the three, the three, uh, the two brothers and the sisters, each one was a, a continual ongoing miracle throughout all 40 years of the desert. The manna in the merit of Moses and the well that went, that followed and traveled together with the Jewish people in the merit of Miriam, the sister, and the clouds of glory that protected the Jewish people in the merit of Aharon, his brother, and when the first two passed away, it all returned in the merit of Moses. So this Hanagan, he knew how God runs the world, and he was given the key or the ability also to run and to lead the generation with loving kindness. Once more, to lead someone with loving kindness means, means to do the supernatural for that person, to lead him in a way which is not just the confinement and limitations of his nature, but above and beyond his natural limitations. Moses was also a very uh, courageous soul. That's the next fira, Gvura. The very first thing that the Torah says that he did is that he actually took revenge when an Egyptian was uh, persecuting a Jewish worker, so he, uh, he smote him. The very first story that's told about Moses and the Torah is an act of, of might. When Moses and Aaron came together to, to redeem us from Egypt, so there has to be a division of uh, tasks it's called Chalukat Tafkidim. The essential task that was given to Aaron was to arouse in the hearts of the Jewish people the love of God and the desire to live, to leave Egypt. 
But the essential task that was given to Moses that Aaron couldn't do was to smite Pharaoh. I Meaning that the, the act of Gvura against the evil, that was given to Moses because only he is capable of dealing with evil. What's more, the barrier that's holding back the Jewish people from progressing and from, from leaving Egypt. So only Moses can deal with Pharaoh. Aaron is an, is an inward arousal of the hearts of the people to desire to leave. Now we have to leave Egypt. So once more, that's a very, very clear and important uh, manifestation of Moses, of the might of Moses, Gvura. The next uh, sfira is Tifera, the beauty, whose inner property is compassion, Rachamim. To explain this, we have to explain a, uh, a secret that the Arizal teaches us. When Moses was an infant, a little child in the, in the ark, so Miriam, his older sister, was seven years older than him. She was only seven years old. She was always very, very mature, little girl. And she, she kept eye on him. And the verse reads, that she stood far away to look and take care of what's happening, what's happening with her little infant baby brother, Moses, in the ark in the river. So the Arizo says that the secret of these words is that she stood and looked at him from afar. Why, why does it have to, to emphasize the word from afar? It says, because she, as a feminine figure, represents Malchut. Malchut is the last of the ten Sfirot, kingdom. So she is the level of kingdom, which is at the very end of the, of the tree of life of the Sfirot. And close to kingdom are the a triplet, the three, three Svirot, which are called victory and acknowledgement and foundation, Nezachod Yesod, which are close to Mahut. But above those three Svirot is another triplet, a Svirot, which are the essential emotions of the heart, which are loving kindness, and might, might implies also awe, fear, and compassion, Rachamim Tiferet. So it says that she could not, that Moses, and then we'll have to explain the deep concepts, at least mention deep concepts in Kabbalah. Moses, which is the light, the conscious light of wisdom, descends into the heart and afterwards into the behavioristic attributes of the soul, which is that triplet, which is close to Malchut. She could not receive, Malchut cannot receive the light of the close Sfirot, because it's too great. Malchut can only receive the light of Moses from the next higher level of his manifestation which is essentially the compassion or the mercy of the heart. All right, these are, are deep, uh, deep concepts, let's try to, to explain. How was, uh, how was Miriam looking and taking care of him? What was her emotion at that time? Her emotion was also a motion of compassion when you have a little infant that's now in the ark in the, in the river. So what does that arouse in the soul? Arouse is compassion. From that very experience or emotion that she possessed towards her little brother, that's actually what was returning to her, the feedback that she was getting from him. 
she was getting for him vibes, vibrations of mercy. And that's what she could receive from him. It means that what was actually being created here was a unification of her self as Mahut, the inner attribute of Mahut is lowliness, as a, as a true righteous king like David is lowly. And she was receiving from Moses and also expressing towards Moses the, the attribute of compassion. She, as Mahut, represents all of the Jewish people, all of the Jewish souls called Knesseties of the Congregation of Israel. Congregation of Israel's Malchut. And its rapport, so to speak, it's looking at Moses and Moses looking back at, at, at them is an expression of compassion. It's actually compassion for one another. It's as though the Jewish people is compassionate vis-a-vis -vis Moses as we'll see, Moses is referred to as the suffering servant that comes to redeem our sins, actually, as the result teaches. So we have compassion on Moses. We have to have compassion on the Moses of the generation. And Moses has compassion on us. It's called direct light and receiving light, the, the rapport, right? at the level of da'at, of knowledge, which is fila above, immediately above compassion. We said that Moses is the knowledge of the whole Jewish people. And everyone has a spark of that knowledge in himself. But when Moses appears one level below that, which is tiferet, compassion, so again, the expression is his relation to us and our relation to him that we each have compassion one on the other, and that is symbolized, according to the Rizal, by the story of Miriam looking and taking care of her little infant brother, Moses, in the ark and the river. Another thing in Kabbalah that identifies Moses with compassion is that Moses is the inner soul of Jacob, of the three patriarchs. The patriarch, which is Tiferet, compassion is Jacob. And of all the three patriarchs, it says that Moses is the soul of Jacob. He said he once more, he comes down from Dat, if we envision the, the tree of life, and he is the soul of Jacob, which is compassion. Now we'll move to, the, to this triplet that we mentioned before, the triplet of the behavioristic attributes of the soul, which are called victory. The word victory also means eternity. Netzach, and acknowledgement, which also means thanksgiving, and foundation. So actually foundation, we already mentioned at the beginning, that's his ish property. He's the husband of the Jewish people. Which also received, the husband also manifests compassion, like husband manifests compassion on his wife. We're taught in Hasidut that the greatest manifestation of compassion is of husband to wife. That's the relation between Jacob and Joseph in terminology of, of, of Kabbalah. What about Netzach? In the attributes, in the seven attributes of the heart, Moses is identified with Netzach, which once more means both victory and especially in the relation to Moses, eternity. The fact that he has to do with eternity is what we said at the very beginning, that he of all souls is the most eternal soul. Because he's always here, he's always with us. There's no soul which is so eternal as Moses. And because he's eternal, didan natsach is the term, we will be victorious because of the eternal presence of Moses. We are the eternal people. Netzach is so, why are we the eternal people? Why does the Jewish people remain and continue. The thing which keeps us alive and gives us eternity, Netzach Yisrael, is the presence in ourselves of Moses. 
משה רבינו. How was Moses present at the very first moment of creation, the very first generation? experience or uh, of Adam and Eve when they were first created. And the Arizal says that when Adam and Eve were first created, they had relation, marital relation, and simultaneously, at the very same moment, That they, had, that they had a union, they gave birth. Eve gave birth. There was no, there was no waiting. It says that they went, the idiom or the symbol is, is that they went to the bed to, and they came down either four, or if they had also uh, twin sisters, six or seven, because Hebel had two twin sisters. If there was no lapse of time between union and birth. Where does that, uh, that amazing, miraculous uh, state appear once more in the Torah? It, this is what the prophet says about the time, one of the signs of, of redemption. That redemption is harav yoledet yachtav, that a woman will become pregnant and give birth together simultaneously. So we said that before the sin of Adam, that was the state of reality, and that will only return to be the state of reality with the coming of Mashiach. Also, in the coming of Mashiach, there are different stages. According to the Rambam, my malady is that the first stage was still the natural order of things. But there's a second stage that's all supernatural. And this, is, this definitely sounds supernatural, to become pregnant and give birth simultaneously. So we're taught that, 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 that uh, this particular miracle of being pre becoming pregnant and giving birth simultaneously is a manifestation of the soul of Moses. Because of his identity with the Sphira of Netzach. His Netzach is both eternity and it also implies above time, not just eternity in time. That's more the fact that Moses returns every 50 years is not just that he, he like skips, skips throughout history, but it's actually because he's above time. Totally being above time is, is the crown, but that this particular element or facet of the crown manifests in Netzach, in the essence of Netzach, he's above time. And in this world, being above time means being above the nine months of pregnancy. But the most important time period, something which depends upon time, that you have to give it its time for something to become ripe and develop and be pregnant. But if something is above time, so pregnancy is instantaneous. So that's a manifestation of the presence of Moses. So actually Moses therefore was present in Adam and Eve, before the sin. And Moses will be present again, ultimately, in the time that this verse of the prophet will be, will be fulfilled, which is Harabi Oledet Yachtav, become pregnant and give birth together, simultaneously. So this was all about uh, Netzach. The next surah is Hod. Hod is something explicit in the Torah. That after Moses came back, came down with the second tablets, his face shined, radiated 
rays of light, and those rays of light that radiated from his face are called Karne Hod, because the word Hod, in addition to meaning acknowledgement and thanksgiving, also means splendor, and it means an aura of splendor. The Arizal says that Moses had two, the two levels of light, one called the inner light and the other the outer, or the Ormar Kiv, the surrounding, encompassing light. His inner light he received at birth. When Moses was born, it says, Vatero Tokitovo. His mother saw him that he was good, and good means light. Like at the beginning of creation, God saw the light to be good. And that's why the sages say that what it does mean that she saw that he was good, that the whole, the whole home became full of light. So you might think that, that the whole home, the whole room became full of light, means that it's a surrounding light. No, it was light coming from his inner soul. So once more, the resource is that that initial, innate light that he had from the moment of birth was his inner light, his orpnimi. But when he merited the karneho, the rays, the radiation of light that came out of his face with the giving of, of the tablet, of the Torah, that's his or makif, his encompassing surrounding light. And once more, that or makif is called his hold, his splendor. The splendor, the word concept of splendor is also used in relation to a king, which is the last sphere. Because now actually we've done all of these we wrote up, up until the last. The last is Malkut. At the end of the Torah, the very final portion of the Torah, it says, Vahibi Shurun Medech. Jeshurun, Yeshurun, is one of the names of the Jewish people of Am Yisrael. It says, Vahib in Jeshurun, in Yeshurun, there was a king. Who is that king? There are two different readings. That king either refers to God, that God is the king, or it refers to Moses. It's the only verse that says that Moses, that according to this one interpretation, both of them are also true simultaneously. Whenever there are two interpretations of the sages, both are correct at different levels. And they both intertwine or intermingle or unite. So on the one hand, God is the king. On the other hand, Moses is the king. Because Moses was totally no to, to God. The king, one of the things that identifies this, a king is that he has this aura of splendor. As it says in Kabbalah, malchut, kingdom is reflected or relates to hood, to splendor. And the splendor of Moses are his Carne, his radiance of, of light of splendor. So actually now what we've done in short is gone, th gone through all of the actually 11 Sfirot because we began with Keter and we uh, included also Dat. And we said that Keter is especially pertinent to, uh, to, the, to today, to this week's uh, portion, actually the very first part the place that you would expect for Moses' name to appear in the portion is the very beginning, which is the reading of today, in this year, the day of Zion Adar. And the name doesn't appear because he is now at the level of Ayin, at the level of Elohim. So this will now take us to the, to the next, to the next uh, topic that we'll try to do even more in short which is the, we said the most has to do with history, because he's, on the one hand is history, all of history is the history, the unfolding of the soul of Moses. And we said that that's actually because Moses, in I and he's above time altogether. On the one hand he's above time netza, but he appears in every generation, and especially, as the Arizal says, he returns every jubilee, every olam, every 50 years. As Ayin, Moses, the man of God, Isha Elohim, so 
we actually is rooted in this name of God, which is Elohim. Man, the first man, Adam, was created with Selim Elohim. In the image of Elohim. Meaning in the, that man, in a certain way, Adam was created in the image of Moses. And the Arizal says that the first man, Adam, he reached the level which is called in Kabbalah the Chaya, or the wisdom of the world of Atzidot, the world of emanation. And that same level Moses also reached. So from Elohim comes Adam, which is the image of God. Then Adam splits into two soul roots, which are called Hevel and Cain, Abel and Eve, Abel and Cain, Cain and Abel. Cain is to the left, and Abel is to the right. Tracing Moses, Moses relates to Hevel. Cain, Cain killed his brother. Abel, Hevel. But it doesn't mean that Cain is all wicked. Cain also has good to him. It says that the good in Cain will, will especially manifest at the very end of history, in our generation, the coming of Mashiach. But it was also throughout all of history, Cain appears, also in the good, not just in the bad. The good, the the ultimate good of Cain, of Cain, is the prophet Elijah. So it says that all Jewish souls have two, two essences or two components to them. Every one of us. He has a right component, which is Moses. This is another meaning that Moses is the right, because he comes from heaven. And he has a left component, which is Eliyahu. Eliyahu was a zealot. Coming from coming from the left. At the end, he will metamorphosize and, and bring, bring the tidings of good, of peace. He's the prophet of peace. But in his lifetime, in this, in this world, he was a zealot. Moses also began as a zealot when he smote the, the Egyptian. But there are many, many uh, secrets and things that the Hariza uh, teaches about that smiting of the Egyptian, which is not just taking revenge, but it's actually elevating his soul, because the soul of the Egyptian was also a part of the soul of Cain that had previously, in the previous incarnation, had killed Moses, because Moses is able. And now Moses has to kill him, not because he hates him, because he wants to take revenge. The Hariza says that he killed him in a, in a feeling of brotherhood. <laughs> that he wants to elevate him. And when he elevated him, he came back and entered the soul of Jethro, the father-in-law to be of Moses, who converted to Judaism. Because he also came from Cain. When Moses killed that Egyptian, he elevated his soul in order to return in another related soul, because both of them are from Cain, and that his ultimate rectification will be that he will convert. That's what Moses accomplished. So even though he's a zealot, it says that he killed that Egyptian with a holy name, with Shema Maforash. Elijah is Pinchas, when he killed Zimri, and after he killed Bilam, he, he, on purpose, it says in the Zohar, did not kill them with the Shema Mufarash, but with the sword. But Moses killed the Egyptian, means you can be a zealot using the holy name. Holy name means holiness. That the act is, you're doing it on purpose to be holy, meaning to have a holy result to it. That's the way Moses killed the Egyptians. So again, we're now saying many, many things together. From Elohim comes Adam. 
from Adam, Adam splits into Hevel and Cain, and Moses is Hevel. When Hevel was killed, he returned as Shet, as Shet said, this the Torah says explicitly, that says is in place of Hevel. So also Moses is returning as Shet. The Arizal says that one's very simple acronym of Moses, that Moses is history backwards. That it's Moses, Moshe, Shet, Hevel. The initial letters of those three names spell Moses, Moshe. So from Hevel he goes to Shet. From Shet, and I'll say it quickly, from Shet he goes to Noah. From Noah he goes to Shem, the son of Noah. But Noah is like a replay of Adam, and Shem is a replay of Shet. And from Shem, when you spell Moshe backwards, it's Hashem. From Shem, we're all Semites. Semites means that we come from Shem. From Shem, which means a name, what's more of Moses is spelled backwards, it reads Hashem, the name. From Shem, the incarnation skipped now to Moses. So from Elohim to Moses, how many, how many stages are there? There's Elohim, Adam, Hevel, Shed, Noah, Shem, Moshe, he's the seventh. From Elohim, Kol Ashfin, Chavim, all the seventh are dear. It says it also just chronologically from Abraham, from the first Jew, Moses is the seventh generation beginning from Abraham. He's like Shabbat. Shabbat is the seventh. But also in this, call it the mystical line of the incarnations of his soul, he's the seventh from nothing. From, not, from his essence of nothingness, which is his, his essence in Elohim, he is number seven. What happens then? Of all of the early prophets, he reincarnates as Achia Hashiloni. The prophet in the time of the splitting of the two kingdoms, that he prophesied the splitting of the two kingdoms between Rechavam, the son of Solomon, and Yeravam. And actually he signed the constitution of the northern kingdom of Yeravam. However very, very great he was, but the fact that he signed the constitution of the northern kingdom, the sages, we consider that to be a, an Avera, an unconscious trans transgression that he has to rectify. And he rectifies that by returning and teaching Rabbi Shim Bar Yochai, and teaching the Baal Shem Tov. His name means to, to sew together. He cut and tore apart the two kingdoms with his prophecy. His rectification is to sew them back together. That's what his name means in Hebrew. So from Moses, Moses jumps to Achia Shiloni. That's what the Arizal says. Then afterwards, the most amazing jump, the next stage in Moses, is that he goes to another prophet whose name is Zechariah ben Yehoiada. Zechariah, the son of Yehoiada, is not the, one of the 12 minor prophets whose name is also Zechariah. This is another Zechariah. Zechariah, the book of Zechariah, of Zechariah that appears in the Bible, is in the time of this, the beginning of the second temple. But now we're talking about another Zechariah. We're talking about the Zechariah that is in the time of the first temple. And he's the son of the high priest. He's both a priest. He himself was a high priest. Zechariah's father was a high priest. Yehoiada. He was also a prophet. The Torah, the Tanakh, the Bible calls him a prophet. And he was also a judge. He had three, three tasks, three properties. 
he was in the time of the king of Judah, his name was Yoash. Yoash, as an infant, was, was kept in secrecy six years in the Holy of Holies. Because the woman that was uh, at that time the queen of the people, the king of the people, Natalia, wanted to kill all of the royal lineage. And Yehosheva, the wife of Yehoyada, saved this one little infant from the house of David and hid him for six years in the Holy of Holies of the Temple. And then there was a, a usurp, usurped the, of the kingdom a revolution against this wicked woman called Atalia, led a revolution which was led by the high priest Yoyada. And Yoash was, came to reign at the age of six. As long as Yoyada was alive, Yoyada taught and took this king in a good way. But when Yehoiada passed away, it says that the officers of the kingdom, the ministers of the kingdom came to Yehoash and bowed down to him as a god and said that the high priest can enter the Holy of Holies only once a year. And you were there for six years. So you must be God. It says that he uh, unfortunately uh, accepted this uh, this false, this falsehood, and uh, and began to to worship himself, together with those others that wanted to worship him, and obviously this uh, degenerated immediately into into idolatry in the whole kingdom of Israel. And the son of Yehoiada whose name is Zechariah, who was once more the priest and the, and the prophet and the judge of the people of his generation, according to the Rambam, he's one of the line of the passing of the Torah from generation to generation, Zechariah. He received the Torah from his father, Yehoiada, and he passes the whole Torah to the first written prophet of Israel, whose name is Hosea, Hosea ben Beiri, so he got up and stood over the people and, and uh, told them that you're leaving God, so God will leave him. He uh, chastised the people. What happened? And the people became very uh, aroused and angry and they killed him. He was killed in the temple. Because he was killed, this, at, at the moment that he was killed, this prophet, Zechariah, so he said his last words, Yerah Hashem Rosh, God should see this and should take revenge. Those were his last words. And, uh, and actually it happened that immediately there was, the, there was a war against uh, Judah, and uh, Yoash was killed at the end. But that wasn't enough. 200, over 200 years afterwards, at the destruction of the first temple, as we read in the Machzor of Yom Kippur and our prayers on Yom Kippur, his blood was still boiling. They spilled his blood in the temple. He didn't even cover it up. And his blood continued to boil for over 200 years when the wicked Nebuzadran came to destroy the temple. The officer of uh, Nebuchadnezzar. So he saw this boiling blood, he didn't know what it was. He asked people, who this, what, what, what is this? They, they didn't tell him at the beginning. Afterwards, they were forced to tell him. He said that he's going to kill priests and kill the Sanhedrin, the judges of the people, one after the other until the blood stops boiling. 
But it didn't stop until at a certain point he turned, he, this wicked officer, turned to God and he said, do you want me to kill the whole, your whole, all of your children, the whole Jewish people? He says that at that point, God told the blood. To, at that point, it came from this wicked Nuvuzadran. At that moment, God told the blood to stop, to stop boiling. And the end of this story is that that very same wicked officer that killed the thousands and tens of thousands, because of this miracle that he saw with his own eyes, he, convert, he himself converted to Judaism at the end. In any event, this is a, there's no other story similar to this in the whole Bible. And the Arizal says that this, after Achiyash, you don't need this, this Zechari himself was killed and his blood continued to boil for hundreds of years. He is, he is Moses, he is Moshe Rabbeinu himself. And after him, the next skip that the Arizal says is Rabbi Shim Bar Yochai, which is way, way later. And the next skip is Mashiach. So how many, how many do we have? How many do we say now? Until Moses, we had, we had uh, seven. And now we've added another four. Achiyah Shiloni, Zechariah ben Yoyada. Is a, is a, is a, is a, a priest and a prophet and a judge just killed. How did God let that happen? He chastised the people and they killed him. Everything God is in control of. Did he do something wrong? So the sages teach us that when you read in the Bible, the way that he chastised the people, it says, me Allah am, that he stood above the people. We said that before. What do you mean he stood above the people? He held himself higher than the people. He, in the terminology of Ghazal, he niach anvitanuto. He left away his humility. And that was the reason for this whole thing. This itself is the illusion the most amazing illusion that this is Moses, because who is the most humble of people? The epitome of humility is Moses. And at this moment, in his coming back as a Chaya, it says that he left his humility. That's the term. And he stood above the people and he chastised them, and that's why he was killed, and, the, and all of the terrible ramifications of that murder of the prophet. If we have here 11 stages, so these themselves correspond to the Sfirot. We need that Elohim, as we said before, is Moses at the level of Ayin, of Keter, like in this week's Torah reading. Adam is wisdom, it says in Kabbalah. Hevel are the is the right side of understanding. Shet, I'm just now saying it in short, Shet is knowledge. Noach and Shem are just under Adam and Hevel. Moses is not the ferret, is the middle, and the seventh is the middle shirah of the heart. These two prophets that come afterwards, Achiyah, and Zechariah, Ben Yehoyada, Arnetzach, and Hod, about the Sphira of Hod, it says, Hodine, Pankhalai, Lamashrit, that Hod changes over and becomes a source of destruction. And that's exactly relates to Zechariah, to the Zechariah that we've been just told about. That he becomes the origin of destruction. And this is Moses himself. And then who is Rabbi Shim Bar Yochai? That's used to that, the Tzaddik Yisot of them. And who is Melech HaMashiach, the King Messiah? is the King. That's more, these, this line, this is the, called the spiritual soul lineage of Moshe Rabbeinu, 
is from Keter until Malchut. I'll let everybody calculate the Gemati of all of these 11 stages and you'll see something which is most wondrous. The final word that we'll say is that there is a very famous a chapter in Isaiah, chapter 53. It begins at the end of chapter 52, which is called the Suffering Servant. The Arizal says that this whole chapter, there are different uh, interpretations of who it refers to. Either to one interpretation that refers to the Jewish people as a whole, another interpretation that refers to the Messiah. And we know, probably everybody knows what the Goyim say about this chapter in Isaiah. But the Arizal, what people do not know is what the Arizal says. The Arizal says that this whole chapter, this, we'll call it this chapter of the suffering servant is Moses. Moses throughout history. Of whom it says, he nei that my servant, whenever it says my servant, it's referring to Moses. That's the way the chapter begins. He nei yaskil avdi, that my servant will become knowledgeable. Yaskil will become, also will succeed, it means. Yarum, he will rise, and he saw even higher, he got even higher, ma'od, until he reaches the level of Adam before the sin, and even higher than that. There are five levels of elevation. And then all of the verses, the Arizal reads in relation to Moses. At the end it says that he, he places his grave with the wicked. One of the, there are many, many phrases. The Arizal says that that means that he, just like Moses, buried himself. So in every generation, he places his grave, means he buries himself in that generation. That relative to him, that generation is called the evil, the wicked. I mean, that he is buried, he places himself, he kills himself to redeem and to save every generation of history. Well, there's a very amazing, a very important thing to know that the Arizal interprets that whole chapter in relation to the history, throughout history, of Moshe Rabbeinu. So with this we'll conclude and we can now take some questions.